Hello everyone, welcome to episode 3 of the Provcast. I figured with my server being Dark Souls 3 based, kinda sorta, that I might as well just talk about what's been on everyone's mind lately, and that's Elden Ring. I just wanted to give my two cents on some of the stuff that we've seen so far. If you guys haven't already, I highly recommend you check out Iron Pineapple's Elden Ring video. He did a really good job, and I would say a much better job than FromSoft themselves did, at showcasing a lot of the new gameplay mechanics and what sets Elden Ring apart from Dark Souls 3. As far as the single player aspect of the game goes, I actually think I had my doubts at first, but after watching his video, I think the single player actually looks pretty good, and that shouldn't really come as a surprise to anybody. I don't think anyone questions FromSoft's ability to make a good single player game, and I don't really have anything to say about the topic that wasn't already covered in his video. And that's why I'm going to talk more about the PvP aspect of the game, what I think most of us are more interested in and just some of the predictions that I have for it and what my opinion is based on what we've seen so far. I just want to preface all this by saying that I haven't seen everything there is to see in Elden Ring. I haven't been able to play the closed beta myself, so if I do manage to get something wrong or I miss something, just uh, feel free to correct me, let me know either my YouTube comments or just let me know on Discord, whatever. So with that out of the way, I want to talk about what I think is one of the most controversial aspects of Elden Ring, which is the reuse of animations from Dark Souls 3. I think a lot of people led themselves to the expectation that because Elden Ring is a new IP, similar to how Sekiro was a new IP, that like Sekiro, it would look and feel a lot different to Dark Souls. However, as far as whether animation reuse is inherently good or bad, I don't think you can make a concrete argument either way. I think it's highly subjective and ultimately comes down to personal preference. I believe for every one person that is disappointed that the animations are the same and the game is going to feel very similar, I'm sure you can find another person who is relieved that the game is very familiar and that they can just jump straight into the world and story that FromSoft have created without having to relearn the basics. However, what isn't subjective and is instead very objective is that with reusing Dark Souls 3's animations and engine, Elden Ring is going to inherit a lot of the problems that Dark Souls 3 has, and those can be simple things like glitches, like Estus Cancel, which is confirmed for Elden Ring, and design limitations such as slow weapons being very unviable in high tier PvP, and PvE being made very easy by iframes being too strong. And what I mean by the iframes being too strong thing is my biggest gripe with Dark Souls 3 PvE is that double rolling is incredibly powerful because you're in iframes for most of the time. So let's say a boss swings and you roll too early and you actually make a mistake, you can roll again and a lot of times you'll get get out of jail free for no damage. And it creates this very unsatisfying game mechanic where you've essentially been rewarded for making a mistake. And I haven't seen anything that would imply that that's no longer the case. And in fact, it seems the opposite. It seems like they've doubled down on this. And jumps, the new move that they added, actually have iframes, which if you guys have seen the video, it looks incredibly silly, where by jumping straight up and down, you're able to phase through attacks. And back to Estus Cancel, it really doesn't leave a good first impression to me that FromSoft have neglected to fix a very simple bug. Um, with these games, I'm not expecting like a perfectly balanced PvP experience, but for them not to be able to fix Estus Cancel it really just shows a lack of effort on their part, and I think they can do better, and I'm crossing my fingers for it because there's still plenty of time bef both before and after the game's release for this to be patched, but Really, that's just, I feel like that's just not good enough. Next up, I want to talk about some of the new mechanics that we've seen and what I believe their implications will be for the game's PvP. So first up, they've changed the way that weapon arts work. So now instead of each weapon starting with a weapon art, you kill PvE enemies and you get their ashes and you insert those ashes into the weapon and that's what gives it the weapon art. And it also changes, I believe, its scaling characteristics. So it's very similar to the infusion system in Dark Souls 3. And I see this having one of several effects on the game. First off, it could increase build diversity because now, if you want to access certain weapon arts, you'll have to use certain builds. There will be more uniqueness between different builds rather than simply being damage numbers or just the color of damage that's dealt. 
Um, on the other hand, if one weapon art is a lot stronger than the rest, it could decrease build diversity because now everyone's going to want to use that build to be able to access the best weapon arts. Um, however, the third and what I think is the most likely possibility is that it's not going to have a very marked impact on the game at all. If you look at Dark Souls 3, weapon arts in general aren't very good and they're very rarely the reason a weapon is good. If a weapon has a good weapon art and is used in high tier PvP, it's usually not because of the weapon art. It's The weapon art is most likely secondary to why that weapon is good. The next change that I notice is that equip load is now tied to strength instead of being its own stat, vitality, back in Dark Souls 3, which I think this could be good. Uh, you guys will know that in Dark Souls 3, strength is considered one of the weaker out of the main builds, so having that extra edge could make them more viable, but that would largely depend on Elden Ring's game balance and how, the, how everything works there. So it's, it's highly dependent on too many factors for me to say whether this is going to be a good or bad change. And if armor is going to be really strong in Elden Ring, then we could see strength become this stat where you're going to want a certain minimum of it on any build you use, kind of like how Vitality is now. So I think it's way too early to say whether or not this is a good or bad change, but it is a little interesting. So the next change that I noticed is that attack sequences are now going to be five to six attacks rather than the two that they were in Dark Souls 3 on most weapons. For example, in Dark Souls 3, when you swing a straight sword, it goes left, right, left, right, left, right. So left and right are your only attacks. So each sequence is just two attacks. Whereas in Elden Ring, I the way it's going to work is now there's going to be every time when you hit R1, there will be five or six unique attacks before the, the sequence resets, um, which I think is interesting for flavor. However, this is going to have zero impact on the game, both PvE and PvP, and I'll tell you why. In PvE, when you're fighting bosses, which is, at least in Dark Souls 3, the only times where like your skills are actually challenged, there's very few bosses that will give you the opening to swing more than two or three times, let alone five or six. So your ability to use this is probably going to be moot in PvE. And in PvP, I mean, it's the same deal. Like, you R1, R1, and then after that, they're free from hit stun. so you're usually queuing another R1, or maybe trying to do an R2 for the roll catch. There's very few circumstances in which you're going for 5 to 6, unless you're like value and just play like a fucking monkey. And this is going to be even more true in Elden Ring, because they've removed two hit combos entirely. Now it's only going to be a single swing, and then they're going to be able to roll. And I'll talk about that a bit later. Also, every weapon is going to have two running attacks instead of one. I don't think this is going to make a huge difference in PvE, because I don't remember a circumstance in which a running attack is necessary. I mean, you can go for them in PvE, but it really doesn't make a difference whether you do or not. And in PvP, 99% of running attacks are easily reactable, so just adding another reactable running attack isn't going to change the game at all. They made a lot of changes to the invasion system, and these are mostly actually really good. So first of all, you won't be able to invade solo hosts anymore, unless they use the equivalent of a dried finger item. And this is a really good change. Anyone who disagrees is either brain damaged or so much of a scrub they need every advantage in the game to win, or both. If someone disagrees with me on this, they can be onine me, because they're completely wrong. It, no, not being able to invade solo hosts is a good change, because Solo host invasions are the most boring shit ever if you're semi-competent at the game. Uh, there's also a host indicator now, so you'll be you'll have a mark on your compass pointing to where the host is, but the host won't be able to see where you're coming from. I think this is a much needed change. Um, this would have been great to see in Dark Souls 3 because a lot of invasions are just spent looking for people. And it also gives the invader an advantage that they might not have had before. And we all know like invasions are typically stacked against the invader, so for them to be able to have that nice advantage is, is really cool. Invaders also get an item that will let them teleport to somewhere close to the host. Kind of like a black crystal, but it doesn't take you out of the game, it just moves you closer to the host, or further away if you're already next to them, and I can kind of see how that might be abused and they might need to change it. 
Uh, I assume the intent is to sort of condense that huge open world because there is no longer areas cordoned off by fog walls and stuff. So if you're invading a host, they have access to the entire overworld map. So it can get a little out of hand, even if they aren't allowed access to their horse. But the animation to be able to teleport away is super short, and I don't even know if it can be interrupted. So what Iron Pineapple found is that if an invader is losing, they can just hit that item and teleport a little further away from the host and be able to heal and do all that. So I, I don't know if that was intended or if that's going to be patched out later. It, we have yet to see. But in general, I think it's the right idea, but uh, the execution might be a little off. So back to general PvP changes, it looks like passive poise is back, which I think most people aren't very happy about. For those of you who don't know, passive poise is where you're standing still and you, you can't be staggered for a certain number of hits at least, whereas Dark Souls 3 did away with that and replaced it with an active poise system where you're only... You're only immune to stagger during certain animations. So, like if you're swinging a really big heavy weapon or using a perseverance weapon art, um, it seems to me like the, it isn't as extreme as Dark Souls One, where you know you could just walk through a bunch of attacks and get a free backstab. And part of the reason is that looks like backstabs have been nerfed, but more on that later. My biggest concern with this change is that it's going to... Well, first of all, it just doesn't feel good. I don't like the idea of hitting someone while they're standing still and they don't take any stagger at all. It just... It, it doesn't have... The, like, it's not a nice feedback where you're just hitting someone and just nothing happens, you know? But as far as how that will affect game balance in fast weapon mirrors, say, like, dagger mirrors or curse sword mirrors... If you time it perfectly and you swing first at your opponent, you can interrupt their opponent your their attack before it even begins. However, with the poise changes, if they're able to tank through that one hit, that just means that your attack is going to be a trade even if you were able to attack first. So, I think that's going to limit aggressive play a lot at least in like fast weapon mirrors. It's too early for me to say like how it's going to have an impact on the larger game. And yeah, backstabs are much harder to get, which is a real shame because I think backstabs in Dark Souls 3 are perfect. They're done super, super well, and they work really good even across varying latencies. So it's really a shame that FromSoft have gone out of their way to fix what wasn't broken. And I can't explain how they've broken them because I don't really understand it myself. But what I will do is link a clip from G9 that just shows like how worthless they are right now. Another worrying change is it seems like they've removed Dark Souls 3's hit stun counter entirely. For those of you who aren't aware how that works, in Dark Souls 3, if you take two hits from one person or multiple people, as soon as you take that second hit, you are instantly able to roll away. There are some exceptions, but that's generally how it works. And what this effectively does is it prevents you from being infinitely comboed to death by multiple people swinging at once. So by removing that from Elden Ring, they've now introduced common multiple people infinite stun locks, which I will show a clip of in the description as well. What this could also potentially mean for a solo attacker is unless they compensate in some other way, all fights are going to last twice as long because instead of having favorable interactions of two hits each, you're now going to have those same favorable interactions of one hit each, so your time to kill is effectively doubled, which as if the threat of constantly being infinitely stunlocked to death wasn't bad enough for the invader, now they're no longer able to burst kill phantoms quickly, which was pretty key to winning Dark Souls 3 invasions. Lastly, it seems like multiplayer is capped at four players in a world at a time, which means co-invasions are no longer going to be a thing, or I, I believe, I don't know, because it seems like every host is able to summon two phantoms, so with two phantoms that only leaves one invader left. So it seems like now as an invader, you're going to be invading into 3v1s the majority of the time, which back in Dark Souls 3, 3v1 was like the worst odds you could go up against. You could potentially face up against four people instead of three, but in those cases you would get a co-invader. So all in all, it looks like it's going to be a really tough time for invaders in Elden Ring, even with the added benefit of being able to see where the host is from far away. I wonder if there will be more planned for them, like they'll have more ambush tactics to take advantage of, or 
they'll be able to maybe use mobs more effectively, but with just what I've seen so far, it looks like invading an Elden Ring is going to be pretty difficult. Which isn't a problem in and of itself, I think invasions should be difficult for the invader, but if they're so difficult that it's no longer fun for the invader or the hosts and phantoms, then it's going to suck a lot of the joy out of the PvP for a lot of people. So I think that's all the observations I have for Elden Ring so far. I think it's going to be a pretty fun single player experience, at least for the first playthrough, and maybe multiple others just because they've added different ways to play the game, like with the added stealth and the summons and all that stuff. I do think it's going to be a good single player experience, but that was to be expected anyway. I am really worried for the PvP. It seems like they've changed a lot of stuff from Dark Souls 3 that really didn't need to be changed, so I'm a little worried. I mean, I'm hoping that my initial impression is somehow off. Maybe I've missed something very key in my observations, but I'm like I said, I'm not expecting a perfectly balanced game. I don't think a game has to be perfectly balanced to be fun. Look at Dark Souls 3, but for Elden Ring to be completely broken when Dark Souls 3 PvP was fine. It's a little worrying. I don't really know why they've made a lot of the changes that they sh really didn't need to. So with all that done, we can move to questions. And we did get some pretty good questions this month, so I'm, I'm pretty excited for this. So first from Jaystro, I got a girl pregnant. How do I keep my son from growing up to be like Midir? Uh, just raise him in a shitty country like Belgium. Midir already said you're in Europe. Your kid will be too brainwashed to ever be me, and I, I think he's correct. Next from Remist, he asked for my workout routine. My workout routine is a uh, 531 Boring But Big by Jim Wendler. Just Google that and you'll have all the information you need. It's, it's pretty good. I, I like it. I would say maybe not for a beginner level. I would start off with uh, Grayskull LP, but I have all that information in uh, body improvement pins, so go check that out if you really want a workout routine. Next, Burn asked, give us your recipe for Philly cheesesteak. I've never cooked a Philly cheesesteak, but I have picked up cooking again lately. I've been following a lot of uh, Adam Raguzia's recipes on YouTube. I like the way he makes his videos. They're super easy to follow, and the recipes are super delicious. Ace asks, what are your thoughts on Nikocado? I don't know too much about him. My area of expertise is Wings of Redemption, but from what, I, from what little I do know about Nikocado, it looks like the guy is eating himself to death and there are sick people who find that entertaining. I feel like that reflects a lot more on the people who watch him than him himself. Um, I pity him a little bit. I think that's kind of fucked up that he's basically being egged on to killing himself slowly. Remus asks, does Prov even read these? Well, this should answer your question. Burn asks, when does a boy become a man? I don't think there's any one thing or one point that determines when a boy becomes a man. However, I think there are a lot of what I would consider to be masculine qualities that are very important, and as a boy adopts more of them, he becomes, I guess, manlier, you could say. Uh, most important of which I would say is speaking the truth no matter the consequences. I think that is, if you, do, if you don't know how to do that, you have no business calling yourself a man, so that, that's all I'm going to say on that. From Burn as well, how can I control my impulses? So the very definition of an impulse is it's a sudden urge. Uh, I assume it has some kind of long-term negative consequence and that's why you want to control it. So that that's really part of the answer already is you need to remind yourself that the long-term consequences far outweigh whatever short-term gratification you're going to get out of what you're about to do and it's difficult to pause and make that assessment otherwise they wouldn't be called impulses um i would just say constantly ask yourself before you make any decision am i going to be happy with myself would the me of the future look back on this and would this be a proud moment for me or would i be ashamed of this and try and try and work from there and I wish I had a better answer for you, but that's that's certainly not an easy question, but thank you for it anyway. Geomad asks, what are your thoughts on the use or abuse of the term racist and how the definition has changed? This is a really good question as well, and I interpreted it in two ways, so I'll give my answer to both. So first of all, I think the definition has been very stretched. It used to mean something very harmful. It used to mean some someone that discriminates against someone else on the basis of race. 
and now very benign actions are included under that, such as making broad observations about an entire group of people or even just having a preference for members of your own race, which everyone does. If you say otherwise, you're lying to yourself. It's biological. It's innate. It's not something we can get away from. And I think that became really apparent during the 2016 election where Trump, who had been in the public spotlight for several decades and never been accused of racist, was suddenly accused of it for running for president. And for what, really? The guy had opinions that would have been super mainstream 10, 20 years ago. Like, he was being called racist for wanting to enforce border security. Like, that, I think that whole thing was ridiculous and tells you all you need to know about the word racist and how it's used in modern times. Right now, like, all it really means is someone who disagrees with the status quo. And I think the media's redefining of the term racist was incredibly successful. Like, if you had asked anybody during 2016 who thought Trump was a racist why they thought he was racist, like, they wouldn't even be able to explain why. They just had it hammered into them by the propaganda the machine that is mainstream media. And... You know, you tell, tell a lie enough times and people just start to believe it. And the second sort of redefining that I've seen a lot of people use is that racism is not something that an individual does. It's racism is power plus prejudice, which is, is really code word for white people can't be racist because according to them, white people hold institutional power over everyone else, which even if that was true, it isn't. It's still a ridiculous way to define racism. What they're basically saying is even if a group of, say, minorities go out and beat up a white person for being white, you know, something that is to everyone, like, obvious, very obviously in a racist act, they claim that that's not racist because that white person has institutional power over the group of minorities that jumped him, which I think is ridiculous, like... That institutional power that he supposedly has had nothing to do with him getting beaten up, and it certainly didn't prevent him from being beaten up. So anyone who uses that definition, you can just immediately discard any opinion that they have. Next question is from Porpy. Yo, I got a neato question. I agree, this question is pretty neato indeed. How would you describe yourself briefly, both good and bad qualities? How would that be different from what others would say about you? Others being like Milkis, some friends, and like randos, I guess. And the reason I say this is a good question is because it's not something I thought about until I got it, which is the sign of a good question. Uh, I like these questions that make me think. But I think uh, one of the qualities that I like in myself the most is my bluntness. You know, I don't really sugarcoat anything I say. If I feel a certain way or have a certain opinion, you know, people will know about it. And as far as how that affects how others people see me, I think it's been very polarizing. I think a lot of people on one hand respect me for it, especially some of the people like Delightful who seem to idolize me for some reason. I don't think I've earned it, but whatever. Um, and I think there's also people like Sen and Maiden who think I'm public enemy number one because I don't hide my beliefs and I, I speak freely without, you know, caring about who judges me for it. And it's a pretty good litmus test as far as, you know, determining who I want to hang around with. Um, if somebody doesn't want to be my friend or hang, like, associate with me because I have certain opinions, I don't really care about having them around anyway. You know, there are people like Paradoxal or Oryx who... I respect them a lot and I hope they respect me too, but you know, we disagree on a lot of things and we can disagree without, you know, being at each other's throats. I think that's a very much a lost art nowadays is being able to disagree with someone without, you know, making it personal and, you know, hating them. You mentioned Milkis as well, like how she feels about me. And I think you should just ask her yourself. I don't want to speak for her, but I think she knows me a lot better than even I know myself and a lot of my close friends do. So if, uh, if you really want to know the truth about how I am, then uh, feel free to ask her. I think uh, it's more valuable to ask someone like her how I am rather than, you know, just asking myself how I feel about myself. Because obviously I'm going to be biased, right? I'm not looking at it from an impartial view. And as far as what bad qualities I have, I'll just give you uh, what I think is my worst quality is a lack of empathy. You know, it's not something that's ever come natural to me and it still hasn't. In fact, uh, when I was a at a pretty young age, I had to see a psychiatrist because it became such a problem and he had to essentially teach me how to put myself in others' shoes, which 
I still don't know if I really learned. I don't know. Maybe I just managed to uh, mask my uh, disinterest in other people's problems or whatever. But I don't know. It's, it's something that my f- close friends and family are super aware of and something that I haven't really worked uh, towards changing. It just never really became a problem to me until I guess I met Milkis. But I don't know. Maybe you can ask her how, she, how that's going. I don't want to... I don't, I don't think I'm in a position to give a fair assessment of my own progress. But yeah, I mean, really good question. I hope that was the answer you're looking for. And if not, feel free to ask again with something a little more specific. It, it was pretty broad, so I tried to answer that the best I could. Inferno asks, should weed be legal in all of America? Uh, my answer is no. I think weed makes you retarded. Uh, I might approve of, you know, med- medicinal use because I think it's a lot tamer than a lot of like the opioids and shit that they put that they prescribe you nowadays, but for recreational use, uh, that's a 100% no. Moist asks, it's the early 1900s, you're part of an Arctic expedition, you're headed for an outpost bunker way up north, far from any sign of civilization. Disaster strikes and you've hit an iceberg. The ship and most of its crew sink to the bottom of the ocean floor. You, two of your friends, a dachshund named Squid, and the ship's navigator are all that survive. You make it to the bunker. There's a storm coming, but you have enough of a window to send out one person to get help. You send the navigator out with some supplies so he can get back to civilization and bring an icebreaker ship to rescue you. There is no food. That's a lie. Uh, You must survive until the ship arrives. What do you do? Well, he said there's no food, but then you also say there's a dachshund named Squid. So I think there's a bit of of a contradiction in your uh, thought experiment. You might want to figure that out. And that answers your question. I would definitely eat the dog. Uh, I would eat the dog even if it wasn't an emergency. Like, fuck dogs, dude. Jaystro says, uh, create a poverty member tier list. And uh, there's a lot of discussion about that afterwards, but uh, short answer is I'm not doing that. Uh, If you guys saw the announcement I put out a while ago, I'm going to do something similar, like do a little montage video of select poverty members. But uh, as far as like a full tier list, I'm just not going to do that because I don't really, I don't see the entertainment value that it would have. I think it would just be a lot of boringness and I have to like crack jokes in between it to make it less awkward. I just don't think it would be a very entertaining video. Chez asked, has there been a moment in your life that really affected you in some way? Um, I would say the probably the biggest one was me dropping out of college. I think until then I was leading a pretty ordinary life. I was, you know, I was graduating high school, go to college because that's just what you do. Um, After I dropped out of college, it was kind of like I had just been thrust into the adult world and I was no, I've no longer had direction, you know, and I really had to figure out where to go from there. And it's, it's been a pretty wild ride, you know, from moving to California and taking up an entire new career, you know, trying to become a firefighter. Uh, I, I would say it's that just cause that was such a diversion from the status quo for me. Moise asks, have you ever pissed yourself as an adult? Uh, I actually haven't, not as an adult, although when I was a teenager and I used to sail, uh, I was sailing in Germany and I was in the middle of like a 90 minute race and I didn't want to lose my spot and it was like super fucking cold, like, I mean like 5 degrees Celsius, super windy, so I I just pissed myself during the race, you know, peed into my wetsuit for warmth, Uh, I'm not ashamed of it, I did what anyone in my situation would have done. Gutty asks a similar question, or have you shit yourself? This includes wet farts. Uh, First of all, I disagree. A wet fart doesn't count. Uh, If you you gamble and it's, you know, a calculated risk and it just doesn't go your favor, I I don't think you can hold that against yourself. But no, I have not shit myself yet. Remus asks, when will you unmod Gutty? Uh, Never. I'm pretty fond of him, even if he is British. Provoke asks, a shart is not shitting yourself, it's sharding yourself. Agreed. Jaystro asks, doesn't everyone have a shitting yourself story? Um, maybe every Europor who likes to be pegged like you do, but I don't, I don't think that's a very common thing for most people. Mr. White says, aside from one of my earliest memories, I have a near shitting myself experience, but never actually doing it. Yeah, I think that's pretty fair. I'm sure some people have had some pretty close calls, but as far as like actually doing it, I think that's pretty unusual. Mental Kid says, my friend told me a shitting story that I would love to share. Um, no one asked. Milkis asks, do you love me? Of course I do. That's my proof. Uh, Remus asks, audiobook of Jungo Tech, please thank you. Um, If you have something interesting from Jungo that you want me to read, I could do that as an episode of uh, Provcast Extra, kind of like how I did uh, Billy Wong, Horse Seducer. 
Remus asks, do you plan to be a firefighter forever or maybe looking at a career change somewhere down the line? And how much do you like being a firefighter? What are the downsides and upsides? Um, yeah, being a firefighter is most certainly the long-term goal for me. I've actually been looking at doing a part-time in fire prevention, which is a little different. Uh, I could explain the details if you really wanted, uh, but still being able to do, you know, firefighter stuff in my off time. Uh, so no, I don't, I don't see, I don't foresee a career change unless something very lucrative comes my way. How much do you like being a firefighter? Um, I love it. It's really like the perfect job for me. What are the downsides and upsides? I guess, yes, for downsides first, so I'll start with that. I'd say the biggest downside is that you, you see people at their very worst, you know, you see, you know, you can see very mundane stuff like people with like really dirty, smelly houses or, you know, people who are addicted to drugs. And you can also see some really, really bad shit like people who are, you know, dead people or people seriously injured. And so, sometimes there's not much you can actually do about it. And that, that just makes it even worse, especially when you have family members, you know, crying and screaming, you know, do something, do something. And there's nothing you can do like it. It's tough. It weighs on you. And I would say that's definitely the hardest aspect of the job. But then I'd also say the upsides far outweigh the downsides. And that's, you know, I wouldn't be doing it otherwise. Um, you know, like I said, you see people at their worst. You see people, people call 911 on the worst day of their lives. You know, they're never having, it's never a good time when someone has to call 911. So to be able to go into, like, walk into someone's house and, you know, help them on the worst day of their life, you know, just by using the training and the skills that I've learned. It's, it's really fulfilling work. And as far as like the skills you learn, um, a lot of them are pretty cool, like being able to drive fast with lights and sirens or, you know, make forcible entry into someone's car or house. You know, how many people can say that they're trained in doing that, you know, legally? Uh, not very many people, probably cops and no one else. And there's so much other stuff too, like when you're part of a fire department, for the most part, you're with an all risk department, which means beyond just fighting fires, which is already cool, you get to learn how to, you know, cut cars open, respond to medical calls, you know, do all kinds of cool shit just to like help people. And it's very fulfilling to be able to learn how to do that and use those skills. It's certainly much more fulfilling to learn how to use skills that will help people than learn skills that will make some corporation richer you know I, I used to work retail and the most draining aspect of it like it wasn't mentally or physically challenging but it was very spiritually damaging knowing that I was convincing people to buy stuff that they didn't need and not even very I wasn't even a very aggressive salesman but just seeing people like buy stuff they don't need um, to impress people that don't give a shit about them and when they're already living paycheck to paycheck just so that you can make the corporation you work for richer. It, it's very spiritually damaging and it, it drains on you and I would definitely not go back to that. And I could go on further and further about all the upsides, but this episode would be over an hour long if I did so. Like I really love my job, but I, I think that's the main part is that knowing that the fruits of my labor are going towards helping the people in the community around me and not enriching some huge mega corporation. Moise asks, how do you like your steak? Medium rare is the only correct answer. Gutty says, like he likes his men. Uh, I don't even know what you're getting at with that. It must be some British humor. Tom asks, do you call it sprinkles or jimmies? Uh, I don't even know like what that, <laughs> what either of those mean. Uh, Shy Guy asks, how do you avoid sexual contact with aliens? I just started sleeping with my squat plug in, so I don't have any unwanted anal probing in the middle of the night. Uh, Remus asks, how do you gain sexual contact with aliens? Um... I don't know, just play the Mass Effect games and do as Shepard does. Inferno asks, what is sex? Uh, that's something sacred that only happens between me and your mother. Uh, Fruity asks, does Jungo even exist? I don't know if you mean the literal sense or if the character Jungo exists. I I don't know, I, th I think he's playing a character, but I, I couldn't tell you for sure. He's If he is a shit poster, he's a very good one because he maintains enough plausible deniability. Uh, Giant Dad asks Jungo as a guest on Provcast. So I think I already said this last episode, but I'm not going to have any guests on for the sake of having a guest on. Uh, if there's a topic I like to do and there's someone who I think will have an informed opinion on it, I might invite them. But for the most part, I'm not just going to have someone for the sake of having them. Uh, Remus asks Jungo as a property admin. Uh, I can't even keep Jungo on the server for more than a week, so I don't know how that would work. Slim says, No Nut November special Provcast episode. Uh, I, I've already done an episode on cooming. I don't want to. I'm very passionate about the topic for sure, but I also don't want to exhaust it. 
because I, I think one episode is enough to spend on it. Uh, Reginald asks, why is Jungo the best person in this community? Uh, I don't know. That's hard to say. I mean, this server seems to have like a very strong infatuation with him. Uh, I guess he's a, just a very fascinating person. Jaystro asks, how did you propose to Milkus? Uh, I have actually not proposed to her yet. She is not my fiance yet. Uh, Remus asks, when is the wedding, if there is one? Uh, hopefully in the next year or two, but uh, you will not be invited. No chance. There, I'm not taking any chance with Proverty members meeting my, my family. Like, no offense to you guys, but it's it's not happening. Burn says, Proverty National Anthem. Uh, if that's something you'd like to work on, go ahead. Um, I have no songwriting skills, so that that's all on you. That's all on you, dude. Uh, Giant Dad says, copy pasta reading stream. Uh, I'm not opposed to it, but it would it would have to be some pretty quality pasta. Angel asks, will you name your firstborn John Fextra? Um, I understand the Fextra part, but I don't, why John? Is that just because that's a is that like an inside joke? I'm not in on. Either way, the answer is no. Uh, Jaystro asks, should diabetics be allowed to live? Um, I don't think Angel should, but I, I would give others a chance for sure. Geomad asks, will Elden Ring be paid to win? I think Elden Ring will be a lot of things, but I don't foresee it being paid to win. That's just not a staple of FromSoft games. Uh, Remus asks, what is your opinion on Elden Ring? I think I already answered that. And will you be playing it, possibly streaming? Uh, I definitely do want to stream a playthrough. Uh, the reason I haven't been streaming lately is it's partially... Like, first of all, I don't really have time most of the time, and it's also uh, a security issue. Uh, you guys know might know that I live in a fire station, so if the siren goes off and I forget to mute myself then now all of a sudden every single boycock spy in the country knows where <laughs> where I live. So that that's not something I'm, I want to risk. But once I get my new place, which should be uh, in December, or hopefully early next year at the latest, uh, I definitely want to be streaming more because I did enjoy the very short time that I did spend streaming. It was a lot of fun. Rudy asks, how much longer do you think this server will last? Uh, that's a really good question. Uh, if you guys haven't known, we've passed our one year mark by, I think, a couple months now. I think I started in September of 2020. And if you include Ratcord, which was basically like the predecessor to this server, I mean, we've been almost a year and a half in the business. From my experience with Discord servers, uh, I've only seen Discord servers die out um, of unnatural causes, usually because, well, for, to have a dis successful Discord server, all you really need is like a dozen or so like really active users because they form the base for the server and then everything else kind of works off of that. So the servers that I have seen died, it's usually because they banned someone from that solid base, which has led to a couple others leaving as a result. And then, you know, it all kind of falls apart from there. But you guys know we don't really ban people, so I'm not too worried about that. Uh, the only barrier, I'd say, to property being less active than it possibly can be is that everyone kind of has different interests which is fine but i think with elden ring coming out i think regardless of whether it's good or bad a lot of people are gonna play it and be quite invested in it uh, i think a lot of people are suffering from dark souls 3 burnout uh, me included i've definitely spent a lot more time this year just recording stuff for it and making shitty videos than i have actually playing it but i think once elden ring comes out that will be uh a hobby that a lot of us can unite around and it should hopefully inject some new life into the server and keep us going for another you know what like five years you know dark souls i mean we're based on dark souls 3 which is a fucking old dead game and you know elden ring is going to be new and it's going to be alive so hopefully you know that'll be a lot better um i think if you guys are want to keep this server going just uh, make sure to invite more people i've noticed like a lot of people seem almost scared to invite their friends. Uh, I don't know why that's the case. Uh, I think it's just because of the attacks we've had from the boycott enthusiasts. But no, I, I, I always maintain, uh, if you want to invite someone to the server, don't even like don't even think about asking, just just do it. Everyone is welcome in this server and that's, that's why I've created it. So that was the very last question. Uh, and with that, the episode is over. So if you guys aren't familiar, if you're, if you're somehow stumbling across this for the first time, uh, join my Discord server. The link will be in the description. You scroll all the way to the bottom and there's a questions channel where you can place your questions for the next episode. Uh, or you can DM me, DM them to me if you want them to be more private. I, I understand that and I won't uh, reveal your information if you choose to do that. 
And as always, if I forgot to answer your question, or if I answered it but it wasn't quite the answer you were looking for, feel free to ask the same or a similar question again in the questions channel, and I'll make sure to definitely grab that for next episode. If you guys are still listening at this point, uh, I thank you very much. Uh, you are the reason that I do this, and don't think that goes unappreciated. Like It really means a lot that even though these videos don't get a lot of views compared to my shitposty videos, I really appreciate the, you know, the two, three hundred of you guys that take the time to listen to what I have to say. It really means a lot. And thank you very much. Until the next one.